All right, turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If you haven't already, we're going to be looking at this passage this morning in detail as the third part of our series on a biblical doctrine of rewards. And we'll begin this morning by reading this section of God's word, beginning in verse 5. Paul writes this, What then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants, through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another man is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, He will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. This text that we're looking at this morning is directed primarily and firstly at leaders in the Christian church with the Apostle Paul and his associates as a leading illustration. And there are two metaphors in this passage that will sort of divide up this text for us. We're going to look at these two metaphors one at a time. The first one is agricultural And the second one is architectural. Look down at verse 9. We are God's fellow workers, says Paul. You are God's field, God's building. And verses 5 through 9 deal with the illustration of God's field. And verses 9 to 15 deal with the illustration of God's building. And what we're talking about when we're looking at the field or the building And both of these illustrations point to God's people, God's church from the foundational era of the church age in the New Testament in the first century down to the present day and transcending and beyond our present day until the Lord returns. We're talking about the edifice, which is God's church, disciple making disciples to the ends of the earth, uh, manifested in local assemblies of believers. Uh, governed by qualified leaders doing all the things that churches should do. The church is God's program for taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. It is what God has been building. It is the field in which he has been producing fruit since the time of the apostles. So both of these metaphors, the field and the building, point to God's church, God's people, God's program. And They belong to him, the church belongs to him, the field, the building belong to him. And we see our place in these things illustrated in these two metaphors. It culminates, of course, in the discussion about rewards and a divine evaluation of our labors. And it's going to be helpful for us to think about these two metaphors. And as we do, just recognize that the we here, the the Paul and Apollos that are being talked about. And, and we would say Paul, Apollos, etc. cetera. The, the apostle and his associates, those who had labored at Corinth for the establishment and growth of the church, become illustrative for the Corinthian believers as they hear a biblical doctrine of rewards. We're going to set the context for that, and we're going to understand uh, that obviously this doctrine transcends Corinth. But it's going to be helpful for us to maybe sit in the city of Corinth, sit in the church at Corinth for a little bit to understand Paul's point. Let's begin with the agricultural metaphor, and this is verses 5 to 9. Paul says in verse 9, you are God's field, we are God's fellow workers, we as in Paul and Apollos and their associates. 
You, he says, you, the church at Corinth, are God's field. This first metaphor, this agricultural metaphor, helps orient our understanding of the nature of service to Christ. This agricultural metaphor helps orient our understanding of the nature of our service to Christ. What is <clears throat> working for the Lord? What is it truly? What is the nature of it? When we're talking about serving Christ, sometimes we think about those things which are most visible, perhaps most tangible. I'm on the vacuum team at the church, or whatever other service we render, or whatever it is I do when the church is gathered. But we need to think bigger than this reality. Service to Christ, the building up of the church, isn't just what happens on a Sunday morning in our gathering, but even as the church scatters, everything from small groups to the ordinary aspects of Christian life. If you are a faithful husband and a faithful father teaching your children, you are an active member of the church, even in those ordinary life things. As you go to the factory and punch out widgets. You do so for the glory of God. You do so as a worshiper, and you are a properly functioning part of the body of Christ. No matter what your nine to five is, you are, from an eternal perspective, one of God's people, joined to the others of God's people in this vibrant living organism called the church. And our ordinary lives outside of our gathering contribute to the growth of the whole. And we know that from Ephesians chapter 4. The proper working of each individual part produces the growth of the whole. And so when we think about Christian service, we're, we're not thinking merely, primarily, or even first about what are you doing in some sort of official service capacity for the gathered body of believers in the local church. We're talking about your service to Christ in the Christian life, which is part and parcel with what God is doing in building his church to the end of the church age. So what is service to Christ? What is the nature of that service to Christ? And we have to understand that your service to Christ is not a matter of prestige or power or position or fame or celebrity. And we often attach the glories of Christian service, if we could talk about such a thing, to those who have most notoriety for it, perhaps even those who jockey for position as the favorite preacher. And, and we as believers pick and choose our favorites. You understand the dilemma from 1 Corinthians 1, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas. Oh yeah, well, I'm of Jesus. And we have the, all the superiority factors going on at the church in Corinth. We'll unfold those in a few moments. But we need to understand from this text that those who had served the Corinthian church did not see themselves the same way as the Corinthians viewed them. Paul, you're so great, I follow after you. Or Apollos, you're my favorite, I'm following after you. Well, Paul and Apollos didn't see themselves that way. And this text helps us understand how they viewed their service. Those who served in the Corinthian church were, were to see themselves a different way than the Corinthians chose to see them. And all who minister in the church ought to see themselves in the way this passage describes for us. And even though the focal point of this text is leaders at the church in Corinth, those who had served in the capacity of, a, of church planter, of apostle, of evangelist, of pastor, truly this is how all Christians ought to see their service in the building up of God's church through the church age. So I'm going to give you just a list of how they saw themselves and then we'll walk through these together. They saw themselves as lowly, instruments, dependent, diverse, as nothings, as one, as different, as fellow workers, and as owned by God. That's a summary of how they viewed themselves. Look at verse 5. They saw themselves, first of all, as lowly. What then is Apollos? And what is Paul? And the, and the question isn't, who is Apollos and who is Paul? How are their identities wrapped up? Tell me about their personalities. But just this, what is Apollos? What is Paul? And the answer very simply, servants. Servants. 
not high and mighty apostle, not the head cheese, but servants. And this, the word for servants here is the same word we get the official office for deacon uh, further on in the New Testament uh, era. But here, just generically, diakonos was a table waiter. We might think today of someone like a busboy, the one who cleans up the table after the work is done. This is a, a lowly servant that nobody thinks of. A lowly servant. That's how Paul and Apollos saw themselves. Not as something special inherently, not to be elevated to some sort of super celebrity status, but as lowly table waiter servants. Secondly, they saw themselves as instruments. Look at verse 5. Servants through whom? That is, they were means. They were God's agency for accomplishing work, but, but they were tools. They were instruments in God's hands. And they were instruments through whom the Corinthian believers had become believers, through whom you believed. And that through whom is really critical. Uh, Paul couldn't actually create belief in the heart of a Corinthian believer. Apollos could not regenerate a Corinthian believer. Behind that, of course, is God's work. We'll get to that in a moment. But they saw themselves as instruments through whom Corinthians believed. And thirdly, they saw themselves as dependent. Notice verse 5, even as the Lord gave to each one. And the giving to each one is not the Lord giving faith to the Corinthian believers. It is the Lord giving capacity and opportunity to Paul and, Apollo, Paul and Apollos. That is, if there was belief amongst Corinthians... And Paul used Paul, or God used Paul and Apollos to bring about Corinthian belief. It was as the Lord gave to each one. In other words, God is behind all of this, and Paul and Apollos saw themselves as dependent. Fourth, they saw themselves as diverse. Verse 6 I planted, Apollos watered. They did different things. And in the metaphor of the field, the agricultural metaphor, uh, we understand that there are different things that are done in farming, some water and some plant. And Paul and Apollos did not have the same gifts or the same opportunities. They did not do the exact same things. There was diversity in their tasks, diversity in their gifts, diversity in their backgrounds and personalities. And then notice verse 7, they saw themselves not only as lowly, as instruments, as dependent, and as diverse, but as nothings. So then, Paul says, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. Literally, the one who plants is not anything, and the one who waters is not anything. And the nothingness of Paul and Apollos here is a comparative to the power required for actual spiritual life and growth. For the actual things to happen that ministry is, for spiritual life to come where there was only spiritual death, or conformity to Christ to take place in the heart of a believer, these are spiritual things, not mechanical things. You don't go to the office of Christian service and follow the instructions and punch out a widget and there's a widget. And for every ounce of labor you do, therefore one more widget. You don't get to make believers like that. And you don't get to grow believers like that. For Paul to plant a plant is not to create the plant nor cause it to grow. And for Apollos to water the plant is not to create the plant or make the plant grow. The actual thing that happens in ministry and in service to Christ is supernatural and spiritual and beyond the pale of human ability. Yet God uses these means. So when Paul and Apollos says they are nothings, that is comparative to the power required for the actual work of spiritual life and growth. And next we see in verse 8 that they are one, they are unified. Now he who plants and he who waters are one. One. 
That is, they're unified in their purpose. They together are working for the same spiritual endeavor that will last unto eternity. And so rankings would be inappropriate uh, if we don't see that Paul and Apollos are working together for the same thing. They, they believe in a unity around their purpose. And that unity goes well with their diversity uh, back in verse 6. And notice verse 8, even in that unity, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor, they are rewarded differently. They are one in purpose and endeavoring to the same goals, the things that last forever, and yet they are rewarded differently in them. The rewards come individually, and the standard of the reward, according to verse 8, is according to one's own labor one's own labor. That is, each man will be rewarded according to what he has done. Notice verse 9, they are also fellow workers, for we are God's fellow workers. And, and the idea here is not that they are fellow workers with God. God's working, we're working. Uh, those things are true enough, but here what Paul intends is that they are fellow workers with one another. Paul and Apollos and their associates and all who would endeavor for the building up of Christ's church, they are peers in this labor as fellow workers. The idea behind the word gods, God apostrophe, uh, is ownership, one of possession. They are fellow workers and they are owned by God. So again, how did Paul and Apollos see their own ministry, their own service to Christ and his church. They saw themselves as lowly, as instruments, as dependent, as diverse. They are nothings, but they are one. They are rewarded differently. They are fellow workers owned by God. That is the way they saw themselves. What is the true nature of the work? Uh, the true nature of the work is spiritual. Again, not mechanical, it is God must do the work. And we see this three times in this section in verse 5, God gave. God gave to each one. Uh, how did Corinthian believers believe? Uh, through servants, Paul and Apollos, as God gave to each, to Paul and Apollos, as he gave them opportunity. God gave these things to them. And then in verse 6, God is the one growing the plants. The New American Standard reads, God causes the growth. It is literally just God grows. God does the growing work. And it's an ongoing uh, form of a verb there. God causes the growth again in verse 7. Three times in this passage make it very clear that God is the one who does the work. That means that his instruments, his lowly servants, the means by which he graciously chooses to operate, they take no credit for the actual accomplishment of the real spiritual work. And that is what Paul is doing here, disassociating himself from credit for the actual work. Yes, I planted. Yes, Apollos watered. But God caused the growth. God grew the plants. He does the real spiritual work. By the way, this is so liberating this frees us up, Christians, to be faithful. To be faithful, to labor, to plant, to water, and not to be a slave to apparent results. Right? If in your nine to five, you are captive to quotas, if your employer sees that you did a really good job and the motivational technique is to boost morale by saying, you made 10 widgets last week, 12 this week would be great because he's interesting and re interested in reporting his quota to his supervisor. So you got to put out more bricks with less straw because you did a good job last week. You should do a better job next week because all we're interested in is the result. Doesn't matter how much labor went in and how much hardship went into those 10 widgets last week. Your employer is concerned about the final numbers, the bottom line. That's not how spiritual work works. If we are a slave, by the way, to apparent results, how many widgets did you put out? Uh, how many baptisms in Maui Roro, or whatever the illustration would be in ministry? If you are a slave to so-called results, uh, apparent results, uh, human-evaluated successes at the surface level, 
If you're a slave to those things, that's what motivates you, that's what drives you, you will give in to innovation, to creativity, to cutting corners. How am I going to produce more ministry widgets? Um, Maybe I won't spend so much time doing those invisible things that nobody sees, and I'll do the visible mechanical things that produce proven visible results. And that leads to creativity, not in a good way. <laughs> but but the one the, the table waiter who decides he doesn't trust the chef and has his own pocket fulls of ingredients and is putting his own seasonings on the plate as he delivers it to the table. <laughs> it results in frustration when we don't get the results that others might expect or that we've put in front of ourselves as some sort of artificial metric. And as we'll find out later in this passage, all such innovation, creativity, and meddling are the wood, hay, and straw that get burned up in the end. What is rewarded in the metaphor of God's field? Planting, watering, Trusting that God causes the growth. Faithful following of God's script. This is, by the way, his field. It's his field. The principles outlined here in this metaphor are spoken particularly towards apostolic ministry, ministry leaders, teachers, pastors, church planters, and the principles outlined here, uh, because the, the idea of the, the Bema seat judgment of Christ and rewards is applied elsewhere to all believers, we understand the, the principles applied particularly at, the, at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 aimed at leaders have by implication principles for all of us Christians, true of all believers. And I believe this is expanded in the next metaphor but it's going to be helpful for us to understand for a few moments why Paul highlights here on his own ministry, on the ministry of men like Apollos, why he is highlighting the serious culpability and accountability of Christian leaders and how they go about these things. Because it is an indictment of the Corinthian attitude. The reason that he's highlighting here his own ministry and that of Apollos is he is addressing a fundamental Corinthian problem. Turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And looking at verse 12, Paul gives account of the report that he had heard. Each one of you is saying, verse 12, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one would say you were baptized in my name. Now, I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel and not in cleverness of speech so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. What is going on here at Corinth? There are divisions there are favorites, there are celebrity loyalties, there is worldly assessment of ministries. In fact, from 117 all the way down to the end of chapter 2, we understand from the Apostle Paul that the message of the cross of Christ was adulterated or threatened to be adulterated uh, by uh, an undoing of the foolishness of a crucified Messiah. And followed by that, the method of proclaiming Christ was to be unadulterated. You, you, you don't mess with the message and you don't mess with its method. Both are foolish, by the way. The message is foolish and the method of proclaiming the message is foolish if evaluated by natural man. Yet we understand that the preaching of the cross and the simple, clear, unadulterated, unadorned preaching of the cross by methodology which are foolish in the eyes of man, are the wisdom of God, truly. And God is actually out to dismantle the so-called wisdom of man by proclaiming a foolish message in a foolish manner. 
And, and both of these things were threatened by the Corinthian attitude. Corinthians were infatuated with the celebrity practitioners of a sophisticated, stylized, rehearsed, perfected delivery. It was entertainment. And it was a method that actually undercut the simple, clear, powerful message of Christ crucified. Where is the power for real life? It is in the gospel unadorned. But the Corinthian attitude was shaped by their culture. They had become squozen into the mold of the world around them. They were like what they were entertained by. The fancy orators who went about packaging truth or untruth in really compelling delivery style as if that had the power. And the powerful message is the message of Christ crucified. The message itself was already foolish in the eyes of the unsaved. A Messiah cursed by God, powerless and crucified as a criminal. This was blasphemy in the eyes of a Jew. This was a scandal for Jews. Or in the minds of Greeks, a Messiah that was not Plato and Aristotle and Socrates and all the rest. Not erudite philosophy couched in the sophisticated categories and vocabularies of the elite thinkers of the culture. Uh, such a thing would be foolish. How could we listen to such a message? And then this foolish message just presented in straightforward declarative preaching. Where is the logos, pathos, ethos of the trained rhetorician? Don't you know the techniques of the experts who really know how to communicate? If you entertain us, then we will accept your message. And the question at the heart of all ministry is not... How do I get people to accept the message about Jesus? The real question about all ministry is, how could a holy God accept the sinner? How is the sinner to be acceptable before a holy God? Not as, not as how is God's foolish message to be packaged in such a way that the sinner, in all of his wisdom, can accept it. So Paul was committed, Apollos was committed, we must be committed to the very simple, straightforward proclamation of Jesus Christ, unadorned, and the simple, straightforward methodology of God's way of going about it. Is there a way that the holy God of the universe, who gave and, sustain, and sustains every one of their existence and whose wrath abides on them for sin, is there a way that God will accept them? That is our message. The proclamation of Jesus Christ, and that is where the power is. And so the doctrine of biblical rewards, biblical truth, levied here in this passage, aimed at spiritual leaders, at Christian leaders in the church, is, is levied here to correct the fleshly, worldly, temporal thinking of the Corinthian believers. And even as we extract the doctrine of rewards from this passage, to be mindful of the very direct application of doctrine that Paul has in mind from his ministry to the Corinthian church will be helpful for us. It's going to be helpful for us to stop evaluating service to Christ through the lens of human attainment or apparent successes to stop going after the acclaim of the world, of the entertainment value of our ministries, or of celebrity draw, or style over substance, or even the numbers of baptisms. Interesting that Paul disassociates himself from people being baptized by him in chapter 1. It's going to get us away from attaching inordinate importance to the servants of Christ, the servants of the message of Christ, the servants of the church of Christ. Look, what are we doing when we view ministers of God's church out of proportion to what they are? Whether they be apostles, evangelists, church planters, pastors, small group leaders, NGM teachers, Reformation heroes, YouTube preachers, scholars, writers, bloggers, podcasters, or syndicated sermonizers. Whatever they are, when we pit one against the other and we have our favorites and we lift them up onto a pedestal, what are we doing when, when we want to name drop a famous preacher? Oh yeah, I've spent time with so-and-so. Oh yes, I listen to this guy. I I've got my corner on this YouTube channel or whatever it is. 
What are we doing when we affiliate ourselves inordinately with someone who desires simply to be a servant of Christ? Lowly, dependent, accountable. We are projecting onto those servants things they don't want for themselves if they're thinking rightly about their own ministries. And why do we do that? We, we want to affiliate ourselves. We want to align our loyalties and treat them as celebrities. What the world loves celebrities. And, and we Christianize and whitewash that same sentiment in our own hearts. It is a manifestation of our own pride. We want the fame by association. And we can become like hangers-on, like a groupie at a concert. We, we admire the celebrity status, and we secretly want a piece of the prestige, the notoriety that comes with being widely known and appreciated. And preacher brand loyalty is misplaced loyalty. God causes the growth. And this misplaced loyalty brought division to God's precious church at Corinth. Now, there's a caveat here. Honor appropriate to service is biblical. We don't want to lose sight of that. But what is addressed here, the Corinthian problem, is a much more serious problem. A godly pastor would much rather be misunderstood and not honored than to be honored out of proportion as a celebrity. Even Paul's own defense of his apostolic ministry, as critical as it is, Throughout the Corinthian letters, you're going to see it over and over again that, that Paul is defending his ministry as an apostle over and against the accusations of the Corinthian church. But it wasn't a defense of his own honor. It was, in fact, a protection of the foundation of the church. Ephesians 2.20 says the apostles and prophets, that is the apostles and New Testament prophets, the direct revelation from God in the church age before they had a Bible was the foundation of the church. Now, that was critical for Paul not to defend himself, but to defend his apostolic ministry given by Christ was actually to defend the clear proclamation of Christ as the foundation of the church for the entirety of the church age. Now, the Corinthian Christians were tempted to nullify Paul's faithful labors as a lowly servant precisely because he saw himself as a lowly servant. They were infatuated with wisdom and with power and with strength and with visible, evident fruit results. And here comes Paul, sees himself as a nobody, as a nothing, as a chief of sinners, as the scum of the earth, the offscouring of humanity, who just wants to be faithful and does so with conviction and a freedom from the slavery to results a freedom from the approval of man and the applause of men, and was willing to be misunderstood and maligned and severely discouraged for the Corinthian benefit. And because of all of that low thinking, the Corinthians despised him when they should have esteemed that kind of humility. And they tended to be more impressed by self-assertive, flashy, talented, showy, impressive charlatans than by simple, faithful proclamation of truth and tender, humble shepherding care. So I want to walk back through these descriptions of Christian service in light of the Corinthian problem. Go back with me to verse 5. Paul and Apollos were lowly, diakonoi, table waiters. They were lowly servants. The lowly servants were not what the Corinthians were looking for, but that is what Paul was. That's how he saw himself. This is a corrective, an indictment of their fleshly views. Again, verse 5, they were instruments through whom you believed. This is a deflection to the true source of power. Paul and Apollos were means. And, and if anybody believed that, that they became a Christian because Paul, and therefore line up their loyalties to him in some inordinate fashion perhaps with the hope that they could be a somebody like Paul someday. Paul makes it clear that their ministry was dependent as the Lord gave to Paul and Apollos. They weren't celebrities with inherent greatness or power, not to be imitated or, or, or that same kind of greatness borrowed for someone else's self-esteem. Their diversity was important. They had different gifts, different responsibilities, different roles. 
and, and each of those as the Lord assigned. Listen, to have envy of somebody's place in the body of Christ, their giftedness, their qualifications, their roles, their responsibilities is a misunderstanding of God's work in his field. And they were nothings. The Corinthians wanted somebodies, not nobodies. And Paul and Apollos were, in fact, nobodies. And Paul and Apollos were unified in purpose. They were unified together in that one endeavor that lasts forever. And uh, that goes right against the Corinthian problem. They had divided over personalities. Well, Paul and Apollos weren't divided. Christ wasn't divided over personalities, but the Corinthian believers were. And then verse 8, again, they, were, they are to be rewarded differently, that is, individually, and the standard is according to one's own labor. We'll unpack that in our second metaphor this morning. But the rewards are not bound up in the appraisal of man, particularly the fleshly evaluation of natural man. Applause, outward appearances, apparent successes, worldly notoriety. But the rewards of faithful ministry come not in this life, and not on the basis of temporal evaluation of apparent attainments, but those rewards come from God in heaven, in the future, based on what God alone sees, evaluated by the perfect, holy, fiery scrutiny of God's flawless judgment. That day's coming. To see themselves as fellow workers again, verse 9. Paul and Apollos and Cephas, back to chapter 1, verse 12, or any other to whom they would be tempted to pledge loyalty and identity, they, the, the Corinthian believers are tempted to elevate one over another or denigrate another below another based on outward appearances, to rank them like a deck of cards. Cephas is the ace of spades. No, they're all fellow workers. And, and lastly, again, verse 9, they are gods. That is owned by God, not owned by the fickle opinions of men, not owned by brand loyalties, but they belong to God. And the ownership of God is all over this passage. The fellow workers belong to God. The field, which is the church, belongs to God. The building, which is God's people, belongs to God. And so the Corinthians were thinking as mere men. That's how chapter 3 begins. They were rife with jealousy, rivalry, producing divisions in the church. They were impressed by outward appearances. And the doctrine of rewards here is set to countermand the Corinthian thinking. And it has several byproducts for us as well. Uh, but the first application uh, to the church at Corinth was stop thinking in terms of human, earthly, temporal evaluation. God will evaluate. And listen, that's a tremendous comfort for Christians in the church under good or medium or bad authorities. God will hold leaders accountable. We can trust the Lord with that evaluation, um, especially when it comes to evaluating those things we cannot see. Right? We talked about this last week. Believers are to be discerning. There is scrutiny that takes place. There is, is an evaluation of things which are outward, things which are actually said. Paul himself is evaluating those things of the Corinthian church even here in this text. But there are things that only God knows, the motives of the heart, the secrets of men's hearts, that will only be revealed in time. And so we yield evaluation of those things until the end. Let's look again at verse 8. He who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Do you think about the Christian life as labor? Do you think about it that way? Do you, do you think about the Christian life as rest? And I hopefully you, th you think about it as both. The answer to that is yes. But if the idea of the Christian life as labor, labor and striving, kopia o agonizomai, agonizing labor, if, you, if that rubs you the wrong way, we, we need to get a better uh, balanced view from the New Testament about the Christian life. Is the Christian life a life of rest? Yes, absolutely. Rest from dead works. Rest from that hamster wheel of futile, fruitless religion and self-atonement and law for righteousness. Listen, Christ is the end of it. 
Christ brings all that to an end and you enter your rest when you enter life with Christ. His is an easy yoke and his is a light burden for the weary and heavy laden. In him is a Sabbath rest. He is the one who carries our burdens. And finally, he's the one who gives the promise for faithful servants, enter into your rest. And the Christian life is rest now and eternal rest later. All of that is true. And the New Testament pictures the Christian life as labor, hardship, toil, a race, a fight, training. It compares the Christian life to a soldier's life and a hardworking farmer's life. The undistracted loyalties to Christ. There is a sense in which we rest when we die, and for now we labor for the Lord. You read about the Apostle Paul's own life, and in countless labors and hardships, he did all things for the sake of the elect so that they might obtain eternal life. This was the Christian life by example in the Apostle Paul and by command and metaphor for all of us. And notice the metaphors of the results of these labors throughout the New Testament, rewards, a prize, wages. Again, none of these things are in terms that obligate God, right? Some sort of meritorious salvation. We're not talking about how one is justified, how one is declared righteous before God, how one is credited righteousness by faith alone to be qualified for heaven. But the Christian life is a life of good works that God prepared in advance for us that we might walk in them, Ephesians 2.10, which comes right after Ephesians 2.8 and Ephesians 2.9. By grace, you have been saved. All of these things are a package that go together. So it's helpful for us to think about the Christian life as a life of labor for the Lord, a, a labor uh, whose actual work is done by God, the empowerment for it is by God, by the power of his Holy Spirit, by Christ in us. It is Christ who lives in me, Galatians 2.20. It is the work of the Spirit in the life of a believer that produces fruitful labor. But then there is reward for faithfulness in this labor. And the reward is not for apparent successes, Planting and watering, again, in this agricultural metaphor, it, it, the question is not, and the answer in this text is not, how many ears of corn did Paul put out? How many tomatoes did Apollos bring to the market? Who is it that really grew the corn and the tomatoes? God did. What gets rewarded? Each man's own labor in the field. And this is where the, I think the great reversal will happen for us at this Bema Sea judgment. Things unseen, things done in secret, fasting, praying, giving done in secret, will be rewarded by your heavenly Father who sees what is done in secret. The kinds of things that, that fuel service for Christ and his people throughout the life of a believer. Love for God and love for others, those intangible things no one could see bring about reward. And it is faithfulness in these labors that brings it about. All right, that's the field metaphor. And wow, it's 948. We've got 12 minutes to tackle the other metaphor. The architectural metaphor. You are God's building, verse 9. And verses 9 to 15 unfold this picture of a building be, being built that is God's building. And this second metaphor, the architectural metaphor, motivates and refines our service to Christ, particularly with its emphasis on the quality of work and the materials with which Christians build. Notice what Paul says in verse 10, according to the grace of God, which was given to me, again, this is all from God, through God, and to him, by his grace, nothing Paul deserved, nothing Paul had intrinsically, all from God. Like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation. Paul was not saying, I'm so wise that I thought about laying a foundation. Paul says, I laid a foundation the way a wise master builder would. And, and the word for master builder here is architectone, right? You can hear an English word in there. Architect. 
And in the first century, the architect was not just the guy who drew up the, the, the plans, came up with the blueprints and did the AutoCAD work at the design level, but he was also something like the contractor who oversaw the work being done as well according to the standards of the architectural drawings. And Paul here was one as the apostle, particularly the apostle who initiated the work and for 18 months spent time at Corinth, laid the foundation. What is that foundation? Verse 11, none other than that which is laid or that, that foundation which is lying there right now, Christ. Jesus Christ and him crucified is the foundation. And you think about an architect today and an architect can have a portfolio of buildings, Right? What have you done? You know, it's like we used to have, um, grandparents used to have pictures unfold in the wallet and like careen down to the floor. And an architect might have a, a, a portfolio of buildings he's done. And, and in the ancient world, things weren't quite as fast as they are now. Uh, we've got automation and we've got power tools and machinery. Um, sometimes you could get things done really fast if you had slave labor and you didn't care what happened to them. Right? You, you, you could see a, a bunch of slaves dead at the bottom of your pyramid, and that was okay, and you could speed things up. But generally in the ancient world, things took a long time to build. I don't know, Steve, if you, if you went and saw uh, St. Vitus Cathedral in Prague. You see that one? You saw that one? Um, that one was started in 1344 and completed in 1929. Okay, it took a long time to build. And, and, and the, interestingly, the architect, Peter Parler, uh, was a guy who never got to see the finished product. He, he wasn't here in 1929 when that cathedral was finished. And thinking about the edifice, which is the church, which begins at the foundation layer, Ephesians 2.20, the apostolic doctrine put forth by God through direct revelation through the apostles and the New Testament prophets, the foundation of the church, the proclamation of Christ, which eventually becomes the New Testament inscripturated for us, is the foundation for the edifice which is still being built, layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. And Paul laid the foundation, and he hasn't seen the end of it. And Apollos watered the building. We mixed metaphors. So sorry. Whatever it is Paul did next, putting bricks at the next level, he hasn't seen the end of it. And the disciple-making disciples who have contributed to the building up of the church throughout the centuries have not seen the beginning or the end of it, but stuck somewhere in the middle, contributing in faithfulness, hopefully, to what God has done. And the word for building here is a word that means to build onto something that is already there. Verse 12, if any man builds on the foundation. And notice what's uh, given here is a warning. Each man, verse 10, must be careful how he builds on it. Everyone, and, and, and so this generalizes for us the principle of service and our participation in the building up of the church, which we are, God's building, well beyond the era of the apostles, down to our own day and our own service, and it certainly applies to pastors and applies to everybody participating in the building up of the church, which is every Christian. And the warning has several layers. Um, implicit in this statement, no man can build another foundation. That's just an absolute statement. The, the foundation's not going to be re-poured, tampered with, or adjusted. But there's an implicit warning in that. If you think about building a different foundation, other than the one which is lying there, New Testament doctrine, if you, if you think about tampering with that, removing that, undoing that, then look, you, you, you're not building in God's church. You're in a different high rise, a different building project altogether. You're, you're working on one that won't last. You're on the wrong job. So that's part of the warning here. But then, then the warning kicks in in verse 12 to thinking about valuable work and worthless work. These things will be evident. Look at verse 12. If any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, then, verse 13, each man's work will become evident. It will become obvious. That which is not obvious now. What are you building with? And, and houses uh, were typically built with something like straw and grass, maybe mixed in with mud. You could have a, a, um, a, a wood frames around openings and oftentimes thatched roofs. Uh, they're not made to endure. Uh, 
and fire consumes them. But there are other building materials given here, gold, silver, precious stones. And these aren't in, in any particular order within themselves. There's really only two categories, things that survive the fire and things that don't. And why will they be evident? Because the day will show it. It's not always evident now. How is so-and-so building, how, what is the quality of so-and-so's work in the building up of the church at this era in the church age? I don't know, it looks pretty good to me. Something's standing there. But it will be evident. Why? Because the day will show it, verse 13. Verse 13, why will the day show it? Because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. And the testing here is something like destructive testing and proving testing. If you've been involved in fabrication and you've been about destructive testing, you understand you're, you're trying to take a certain material to the breaking point to see what its worth is. But here, this testing is a testing unto approval. It's the kind of a testing that was given to gold where heat was applied and the gold was refined and the impurities are scraped off. It's the kind of testing that was given to elite soldiers. They were evaluated and they were put through a rigorous testing ground that made them the soldier that they became, proved their genuine worth in the testing phase. Think about Navy SEALs and Hell Week and BUDS and all the rest that goes into making a SEAL. The, the training itself produces the intended result and shaves off, burns away, refines those things that aren't valuable to the soldier. For a church age believer, this is what the Bema Seat judgment is. It is a fire which burns away those things which are worthless in order to preserve and demonstrate the genuine value of those things which remain. Interestingly, Matthew 3 and Matthew 13 both use the illustration of fiery judgment to separate things out. But in Matthew 3 and Matthew 13, the separation is individual believers separated out by fire from a population. It is people that are cut away and burned, right? That is a, a picture of condemnation separating people out those things that are worthless and valuable. But here in verse 15 of 1 Corinthians 3, it is the separation of labors, the separation out in the individual believer's life. And so this is individualized. Look at verse 13. Each man's work will become evident. It is a flawless assessment because implicit in all of this, this is God's assessment. And it comes with a, an eternal perspective, the valuing of things as they really are, gold, silver, and precious stones. Can't always tell the difference here, but God sees and knows. And it comes with degrees of reward. There are different levels of faithfulness, different levels of opportunity, and there are different levels of reward. And all of this is purified for eternal residence. We talked about this the first week in our biblical doctrine of rewards, that what a grace it is of God to actually remove those things which are despicable, Things we might have cherished here. Ooh, look at this really cool wall I built over here. Isn't it beautiful? Well, guess what? It was garbage. And we'll see that in eternity and we'll say, oh God, could you take out the trash? <laughs> Thank you. That stuff doesn't belong here. What a, what a kindness of the Lord to dismember us from those things which were in fact worthless. This is the eternal perspective of things purified for eternal residence. And of course, this reward is by grace, again, by, by God's grace in preparing good works in advance that we would walk in them. God's not obligated here. He gives and he gives and he gives. He did the work. He was the one that was faithful to accomplish his purposes and to build his church. And yet he rewards yielded instruments. People who yield their lives in faith to be his means, his lowly servants. This again, verse 15, is not condemnation. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. This is a loss of reward. Picture a man in a house on fire. You built a house out of straw, and it is incinerated, and you escape with the smell of smoke. By the way, this is not a picture of a carnal Christian. Right, the, the, the idea of the carnal Christian the, uh, appeals to 1 Corinthians 
3, um, verse 1, you're, you're, you're behaving like babes, you're fleshy. Uh, that's not a picture of somebody who made a profession of faith and never lived for the Lord. And, and you just hope he got in by the skin of his teeth and he smells like smoke. He never loved Jesus, but he did pray that prayer, so whew, he's in. That's not this. That's a spurious conversion and not a believer and not at this judgment. This judgment is for those who love the Lord, saved by the gospel, walked in fruit that the Holy Spirit would produce, and yet so much of their lives was built with worthless things. So much of their time was spent using the, the tools of natural man. So much of life's work was found worthless. It doesn't stand the scrutiny of divine evaluation. Interestingly, in verses 16 and 17, you do get another category. If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. That is a condemnation verse. Someone who is uh, hell-bent against God's church and brings about the destruction of his church, not a believer, and faces condemnation. But I want to think through in the last negative 23 seconds that we have left, some categories of wood, hay, and straw. And I'll just bullet point these for you. Bad doctrine, bad motives, the taint of pride, ambition, love of notoriety, and self-importance. Natural methods, strategies that depend on man's philosophy and wisdom, appeal to man's approval and applause, creativity and ingenuity in the Christian life and Christian ministry. You didn't follow the script. You said, I got a better way to do this to get more widgets. Discontentment, envy, greed, bitterness. I like what other people are doing. Efforts born out of resentment, the trampling of people. I have a list here of, of building projects throughout world history uh, with a lot of bodies at the bottom. Hoover Dam, 96. Panama Canal, 30,609. The Burma Siam Railway, where 16,000 United States soldiers, POWs in World War II, died building a railway for the bad guys. Are there bodies? <laughs> Corpses in the walls where you ran over people, trampled people to build something for your own glory. All that stuff will be burned up. Laziness, wasted time, trivial things, temporal. We talked about sin as a category that uh, sin is paid for, but the black hole that sin leaves is just this vacuum of wasted time and opportunity and gifts. But the gold, the silver, the precious stones, those are faithful labor unto the Lord. Grace given, grace rewarded, and we all just say, what is God doing? Giving rewards to me for the things only he could produce. He's good, and he gives. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this reminder. May it motivate us and refine our labors for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.